Hi, I'm Dana, Dana the Trainer, and you're about to watch a recording of my session, Belonging at Work. In the session, we discuss what belonging really means, what it feels like when you belong, and conversely, what it feels like when you don't belong, as well as what you can do in your organization to help increase feelings of belonging. I'm joined by my friends, Gareth Mills, who is an LGBTQ plus advocate at Sony PlayStation, as well as a BAME ally, and Priyaneeth Kaint, who is the UK co-lead of the Disability Network at GSK. I hope you enjoy the session and that you learn a lot from it, and see you soon for my next session. Hello everyone and welcome to Belonging at Work. Thank you very much for joining. Who am I? In case you didn't know, I am Dana the Trainer, although I'm thinking about a rebrand to Diversity Dana. Every time I say who am I, I almost want to say that's a secret I'll never tell. XOXO Gossip Girl. Uh, but no, I'm not Gossip Girl. Diversity Dana or Dana the Trainer. I am a trainer, facilitator, and coach in the world of diversity and inclusion. And it is going to take a long time to tell you all of the things that I have done in the diversity and inclusion space. So I'm just gonna focus on the last month. So in the last month, I was featured in CIP HR's thought piece, Can HR Really Fix Organizations Diversity Problems? It's a great read. I was on two panels, one about diversity and inclusion in times of COVID, and the other was a Q&A style diversity and inclusion event. I was a conference speaker on diversity and inclusion in the agile space. And I designed and delivered the free workshop, Is This Okay? that focused on how to step up as an ally on social media. And this is in addition to all of my other client stuff that I have going on. So trust me, you are in very safe hands for the next little bit that we are together. I think a great place to start today is getting really clear on what we mean when we say belonging in the context of diversity and inclusion. So basically, what's the difference between all of the things on the slide? And I'm just going to brain dump and tell you how I think about them. And the first one, diversity, is concrete. It's inarguable, it's quantifiable, it's the numbers, you can count it. So how many men do we have versus women? How many people of ethnic minorities do we have? How many disabled people? How many people speak a language other than English as their first language? How many people have children? How many people are married? What's the age range of people working in this organization, et cetera? You know the numbers if you're diverse. You know if your workforce is diverse, in what areas, by how much, where you have gaps. Diversity is a numbers game. You can tell it purely by looking at the numbers. Now, inclusion is a little bit different. So you're in, you're a number, you made it. Uh, it's about whether once you've made it, you are culturally and socially accepted, if you're engaged within the organization, if you feel welcome, if you are treated equally, that's very important. And by that, I mean that whoever you are within the organization, if you are with people uh, within the same grade level, et cetera, wherever you are, you feel included in your teams, in your tasks that the team is undertaking, uh, and that you have a chance to develop both personally and professionally in line with everyone else. So there's no super secret special rules for any particular group of people. Now, if people are included, that means that the organization is doing the very best that it can to make the most of its available talent and everyone gets to contribute and fulfill their potential. So diversity, inclusion, and now belonging. Belonging is a feeling. It's that feeling of being part of a group and it's about the confidence and the security and the allegiance that you feel when you belong. Belonging means that you can bring your authentic self to work 
And that self that you bring, and Priya started talking about this earlier, that idea of bringing your whole self to work is welcomed and celebrated. So I feel like you belong when you can take off that mask and really be yourself and feel comfortable being yourself and contributing, knowing that you can hear and see other people like you and that yourself is reflected within the organization. So it's a good feeling about all of those things. And this is going to sound strange, but when I tell it, I always think about a nightclub. And you're going to be thinking, Dana, don't even play. What do you know about nightclubs, Dana? And to you, I say, I was not always a mom of two. I worked in the city in London for many years. And I definitely know my way around a nightclub. In fact, I could maybe have a training session called Dana's Nightclubs. Now, if this was a nightclub, diversity would be, do the bouncers let you through the door? So do you even get into the nightclub? right? Inclusion would be, if you're in, do you have the same access as everyone else? So do you have the same access to the bar? If you wanted a table and table service, is that available to you? If you requested a song from the DJ, is the DJ going to play that song for you? Or can only special people request songs? If you met the requirements to get into the VIP room or the champagne room or whatever, would you get in the same as everyone else? That is inclusion. Are you included? And now let's talk about belonging. Not all nightclubs are created equal. And I'm swimming because I just got a private message that said, I know how much I love nightclubs and it's making me giggle. <laughs> Not all nightclubs are created equal. I can tell you this. So one night after my firm's Christmas party, a group of us decided that we needed an after party and we wanted to go clubbing. I got there first and the first thing that stood out to me was that there were lots of Dana looking people there. Awesome. And then to my surprise, I started to hear soca music. That's music from Trinidad and Tobago. And then there was some dance hall thrown in. That's from Jamaica, but music I grew up on. And then there was pop and hip hop, but the kind of songs that you would sing out loud to if you were listening to Spotify or whatever. And it was good. It was a really good mix and a really good blend. And I almost felt like I was in Trinidad. I was transported. And my coworkers had never seen me like that before. I was able to be full Dana. I was passionate. I was energetic. And I didn't have to pretend. So sometimes you go to the nightclub and they're not playing your kind of music. So you're just there in the corner and you're like bobbing your head a little. You might occasionally snap your fingers and you're doing like kind of swingy moves, but you're not that into it. It wasn't like that. It was like the club was made for me. And like I really belonged in that club. I felt it. That is the feeling of belonging. Put another way, and these are not my words, they're from Anita Sands in her article, Diversity and Inclusion Aren't What Matters, Belonging is What Counts. She made this analogy, and I think this is the clearest I've ever seen it. It's that diversity is facts, like indisputable facts, like you know the numbers, they are there. Inclusion is about choice because an organization can choose to enact policies that decide whether or not people are included. So it's a choice. But belonging is a feeling. It's a feeling. I'm going to let that sink for a while, right? Belonging is how you feel. And because belonging is a feeling, it means that two people can work for the exact same team and the exact same organization, and one person can feel like they really truly belong, and the other person can feel like they don't. So given this definition of what it feels like to belong, I have a question for you that I'm gonna ask now, which is, do you currently feel that you belong at work? And I'm gonna launch a poll, and the poll is anonymous, everyone. So 
please do feel free. No one will know what you selected. You won't be judged. Feel free to vote. Where you currently work, do you feel that you belong? Are people not seeing the voting? I'm worried about it because of that little error that was earlier. Okay. Thank you, Garrett. Perfect. <laughs> I have lots of people dialing in and messaging me. Okay, so I, I'm going to end the poll there. Very interestingly, 40% uh, of you felt that you belonged in your current role. So that tells us that we all have some work to do when it comes to belonging. I have an amazing comment from Aid that's making me smile. He says, being freelance, it would be an interesting diagnosis if I said I didn't belong. And that's the way I feel as well. So a great part of being uh, a freelancer is that you always belong because you make all the rules for yourself. But the question, a better question, Aid, might be what clients, when you go to them, do you feel like you belong and which ones do you not? But we can talk about that another time. The thing about belonging, everyone, is that human beings are hardwired to seek it. So for most of human history, humans have relied on social groups for survival. Fact. A solitary human being would not have survived the six million years of human evolution when we were out living on the savanna with all of the predators around. People need people. They need to belong. And we have known this for a long time. I'm sharing Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, I mean, I saw in university yonks ago. By the way, did you know that this was published all the way back in 1943 and we're still talking about it today because it's still relevant? Belonging was clearly identified by Maslow as part of psychological needs and I think that remains true today. It might also interest you to know that not belonging, so when you're excluded, can be painful. And I don't just mean emotionally painful. It can give feelings akin to physical pain. And you are probably thinking, Dana, you're always exaggerating. And so I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit. In 2003, a group of scientists conducted a study called Cyberball. It's a game that they made up. So one of these scientists was playing in the park with a Frisbee with two other friends. And in the beginning, everyone was getting a turn catching the Frisbee. But then at some point, the two friends started throwing the Frisbee just to each other. And he was left out and felt excluded. And he thought to himself, I'm going to make a study about this because I want to be able to assess what this feels like. So they invented an online game. Not because there was COVID, guys, it was 2003, but because they wanted to be able to measure people's brain activity while they were feeling these feelings of not being able to belong. So that's what they did. They set up a game of three, and then at some point, one person was excluded, and they measured that person's brain activity. And what they found from that is that the excluded person showed heightened activity in the two areas of the brain that are receptors for physical pain. So exclusion, rejection, and feeling like you don't belong can hurt and not metaphorically. Now, all of us who are on this session today would have experienced some of the hurt and pain of exclusion. Gareth, Priya, and myself especially, and we're going to be doing some sharing about this today. But before all of us share, we want to do a joint caveat, which is that we are very fully aware that after this, you can go look us all up on LinkedIn and find out what the organizations are that we're talking about. And that is fair. But our intention is not to slate off those organizations. All of us are very grateful for the experiences that we had 
in all of the places that we worked, but it doesn't negate the experiences that we are going to share. Specifically for the organizations that I am going to highlight, I want to point out that this was all the way back in 2008, and it was a very different time then. And this organization has done quite a lot of work in terms of making things better, which doesn't take away all the stuff that I experienced. And so I am still allowed to talk about it, and I'm going to. So the first thing to say is that the firm in question did hire me. I was let through the door and there were many other ethnic minorities working in the same team as me and there was good gender diversity. So let's give them a small tick in that column. They also had really established and robust processes in place when it came to performance appraisals and getting promoted and learning and development and deciding who was going to get to go on what courses, etc. So you were in, you had a seat at the table, and there was reasonable equity and fairness when it came to promotion and personal development and learning. So let's give inclusion a tick as well. But the question isn't about diversity and the question isn't about inclusion. Today we are talking about belonging. And did I feel like I belonged? I didn't, and I'm going to tell you why. The first thing I started, there were maybe 25 other people who started in the same cohort as me, and I was the only black person. But that was fine because like I said, there were other minority ethnicities there and there were a fair few immigrants as well. However, within that little group of 25, I was still an outsider. The first thing is because I was a little bit older so the majority of the group was coming straight from university. I had already worked in Trinidad before moving to the UK. And so I was maybe two years ahead. But there was also another huge difference, which is that I was married. Well, engaged, and then I became married within the first year of me working there. That was huge and a big separator. Because back in those days, I don't know how true this is now, but I can only tell you about my experience, is that a graduate scheme is basically like Love Island, but instead of bikinis, there were suits. Americans, if you don't know what Love Island is, you need to go and look that up at the end, right? I mean, everybody's young, everybody's quite attractive. Gareth has written in the chat, no, don't watch Love Island. I know you guys know exactly what I mean. I wasn't about that life. I wanted to go home and be with my husband. Everyone was partying and loving each other, really loving each other. Um, and fine, right? But I learned that a lot of bonding was happening in the pub and people were getting selected for their next job and their next job based on the people who they met and they socialized with in the pub. So by me going home and not attending, I was kind of icing myself out. But in those days, I wasn't really a big drinker. I said in those days, don't judge me, okay? In those days, I wasn't, but there was all the round buying and all the pictures and you got the pictures and there were the big bowls and everybody puts their straw in. And there was this huge thing that was, Dana, why aren't you drinking? And so I started drinking more to kind of fit in so I didn't have to have the conversation because I was already an outsider. So there it all began. Now let's talk about the actual workplace itself. From the start, it was clear that I didn't speak the same language, and it was true for some very small things as well. Trinidadian people are very direct. To the point direct, we tell it like it is, say it like we mean it. British people, not so much. There's that extra layer of politeness. Consultants, oh my goodness, getting a straight answer from a consultant is like pulling teeth sometimes. So for months, I had people saying to me, Dana, you might want to think about, and they would tell me this thing. And I took it literally. So I went off and I thought about that thing. And if I thought about it and I thought, Dana, you need some action here, I would do the thing. 
And if I thought about it and I thought, nah, it's fine, then I wouldn't do it because they literally told me to think about it. And I did spend time thinking about it. Then I started getting feedback in that I wasn't consistently acting on my feedback. And that's because I didn't know that when someone said you might want to think about this thing, they meant go do that thing. That's what it means. Did you know that? I didn't know that. And then I also started getting feedback that I was maybe a little bit too direct with junior members of the team. And so I learned that when I wanted to give feedback, I also needed to say to them, maybe you would like to think about and say that thing. But it was a whole communication barrier, right? A whole communication barrier. And I spent a lot of time trying to overcome that. I would be thinking the night before about something I wanted to say and putting it in Trinidadian and then translating it into the correct way that I was supposed to say it to do it right, which is incredibly taxing and takes a lot of energy. Sometimes I would have ideas and suggestions and people might say, maybe that's how it worked in Trinidad, Dana, or maybe that's how it is in the islands. And then people would laugh and I get it, banter, banter, all the banters. But then I started maybe not sharing my thoughts and ideas too much because I was worried that my thoughts were too island. I am a very punctual person in general, and I am especially never late when people are paying me to be somewhere. But one day, something unexpected happened. Trains were canceled. I was late. And I was super stressed out about it. And when I turned up to the client, I got a comment about being on island time and needing to remember that I'm not in Trinidad where things are laid back when I was literally never late before. I made it my mission to try and never be late again, reaching for things earlier and earlier because I wanted to fight that stereotype about lateness. And so now let's talk about the biggie, which is my hair. After some months of having my natural hair at work very tidy, I was going to a wedding and I straightened my hair for the wedding and I came to work with it straightened on the Monday. I got so many compliments, it was insane. But it's not so great when the compliment is worthed. You look so professional with your hair like that. The implication being that when my hair wasn't like that, it wasn't professional. So my natural hair wasn't professional. I religiously straightened my hair and it was straightened for the entire rest of the time after that, that I was at the firm. Eventually I left the firm and I went to work somewhere else and it was a completely different world. People were coming up to me. They were asking me for my opinions, for my advice. And at the start, I was still giving my measured calculated responses. And then one day my boss looked at me and said, tell me the craziest idea that you have about this. And I told him, and that was actually the thing that they did. And from that day on, I started to bring more and more of myself to work because I realized that that is what they wanted. They wanted me, like the whole of me, not the filtered me. I learned to unmute myself. All of a sudden, my directness was being praised. It was an asset. My off-the-wall thinking was prized. My unorthodox way of delivery and facilitation and presentation was suddenly a good thing. I didn't need to button up to the point where I once did a military-style presentation with all the chants. I was doing rap in a training video. It was mental, and they loved it, they embraced everything that I was. There were no more suits. I was wearing clothes in my own style. There were no heels. My sketches were fine. I was so confident and comfortable that I could be me that I actually locked my hair. That's when it all happened. I went fully natural. They are actually the ones who started calling me Dana the trainer. They're responsible for this and the brand and all that it is. And I was her, she was me, I belonged, I fit somewhere. 
Now, unfortunately, this didn't last. Uh, someone new came in to leadership and management and completely changed the way that the organization worked and run. And I eventually left. And the reason I'm telling you this is not because I want to put a downer on the story. It's because I want to show you the power of the individual. Just like that individual had the power to change the culture of an organization and take something that was amazing and make it less so, so do we as individuals have the power to take something that may not be so amazing and make it more so. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Now, every time I tell the story of my career, I think about this quote that's on screen from Brene Brown. She's a research uh, professor at the University of Houston, and she does this amazing podcast. It's called Unlocking Us Podcast. She also has a brilliant TED talk that is about vulnerability that I recommend. And she says this, which is that the opposite of belonging is fitting in. And I cannot tell you how true this is. If you have to work to fit in, it means that a part of you knows you do not truly belong. There is something about you that is different. Fitting in means you have to cold switch or speak in a different way to use the language of the group. You've got to mute who you are. You have to look out for stereotype threats and try to combat those. Maybe you're even battling microaggressions. And the thing is, while you are spending so much energy doing that, there are people who don't have to and they just get to sail. They have more of their capacity to use on the job. They can be more productive. They have extra energy and bandwidth to contribute in ways that you cannot even begin to fathom. And that is not right. But don't just take my word for it. I have some co-hosts who are with me today. Uh, first is Gareth. Gareth is an LGBTQ plus advocate at Sony, and he's also a blame ally. And as I mentioned earlier in my Is This Okay workshop, he was one of the few people who spoke out loud, asking a question, sharing his insight. And I knew in that moment that I wanted to hear his story. And I'm really glad that I get to do that today. Gareth, can you tell me about a time where you felt like you didn't belong? Awesome. Thank, thank you, um, Dana, for sharing. Um, by the way, uh, that, that's a massive insight that I've not seen before um, or thought about before where um, people who are trying to fit in, lots of their brain power is being spent on not being productive and efficient at their job. So they're already at a disadvantage compared to other people. So thank you so much for that. Uh, um, also, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak and thank you for everyone uh, listening to me. Um, so exactly the same as Dana, just a couple of caveats before I begin. <laughs> I'm talking about not belonging. Um, so I'm just talking about personal experiences really and I only share them for learning. I'm not sharing them to like bad mouth previous employers. Because uh, similar to Dana, I, I learned a lot of things at, uh, at those places, um, as well as, unfortunately, feeling like I didn't belong. Um, so throughout my career, I've had feelings of belonging and not belonging. Um, and what I found with not belonging is that it's not necessarily created by outright negative actions personally directed to you. It's lots of microaggressions um, and born from ignorance, really. Um, so for me, not belonging sort of falls into two buckets there's the general bucket and then there's the personalized bucket um so in my experience the more general sort of less uh, targeted stuff was when i first started in the games career there was a saying going around i think lots of people say not just in the games industry but all oh, that's gay referring to something negative um mm. and, and just say oh that's gay and mm. uh you know and just commonplace use of slurs it, it was just done and it was accepted and it was fine where I worked. Um, obviously not to me, but to other people. Um, but then there was a lot more personal things like I was referred to as the only gay in the village um, behind my back. And this wasn't like by friends or banter. This was like upper management making mm. these comments. And I didn't know them well enough for them to say stuff like that and for it to be okay. Um, and then there was another time where my sexual preference was shared with a room full of people that I hadn't even met yet. Um, so that, that was pretty harsh. Um, 
but for me really oh and also um when i did when i did come out as gay um someone said to me i thought you were a decent human being so that was pretty full on um so for me really the learning during that time was that um if upper management or line managers or people in positions of power are allowed to get away with that kind of behavior everyone else will follow suit because they think it's fine and that will contribute to that hostile environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's down to all of us to make sure that we're setting the right example and absolutely calling it out when people are not doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's our duty to make sure that people within our team uh, really feel like they belong. And so I, I hear that I was cringing so hard when you were saying some of those things. Ah, <sighs> okay. <laughs> belonging yeah. now. Belonging. That feeling of belonging. Let's talk Excellent. about that. Oh, I love that artwork, by the way. I haven't seen that. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I now work at PlayStation London Studio, and I've never felt so welcomed in any other company. Um, and it's not just within our little London studio, a little part of Sony, but Sony as a huge company across across the company, uh, they're advocates for LGBTQ. Um, so we had a massive presence in London Pride last year, and I think we won Best Floor the year before. Um, and there's a whole lot of branding and support uh, from PlayStation and from Sony in general. Um, and that also extends to digital content as well. Um, so on social media, you can also download um, a PlayStation Pride uh, like desktop, so that, like when you're playing your computer, you've got that on your desktop. Um, but also there's internal groups, so uh, Pride at PlayStation, uh, they hold events throughout the year. Uh, and throughout June, they hold Pride events, and that's open to internal staff and also um, external family and friends. So it's super inclusive, not, not of just the employees, but also the employees, friends and family. Um, and then also we have internal communications like spotlights on LGBTQ staff members and there's also resources for people who want to be allies. Um, and it's not just that sort of light touch. We have um, groups like I say like Pride at PlayStation as well as Women at PlayStation and the newest uh, addition is BAME at PlayStation um, where everyone can contribute to real change within the company. So this is like on a policy level, um, substantial fundamental change. Um, so anything from uh, like any forms that people have to fill in from a HR perspective, instead of having male, female, like we've now got 37 boxes from okay. gender and backgrounds and everything. So it's all inclusive. So people feel that they belong because they're an option in a box. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then also like bit bigger things like uh, we have booba cover. Uh, and that's now been extended to gender dysphoria consultation to cover that for um, for, for what wider uh, issues uh, that people face. So I'm um, sort of like genuinely recognise uh, the value of their staff um, and that everyone is individual and unique uh, and everyone can bring uh, bring bring that to work. And I know that sounds like a big advert for Sony, but like genuinely, <laughs> like I'm, I'm just, you, you'll probably hear it in my voice. I'm just really, really happy and to see a company to allow so many people to feel like they belong is incredible. Thank you so much, Gareth. And I also have with me today, my friend Priya. And yes, I'm saying friend, technically she is a client. I coached her in her role at GSK, but I think we've surpassed that now. And I'm very confident mm -hmm. and comfortable using the F word to describe her friend. <laughs> Priya has Shaka Marie Tooth Syndrome, which is uh, an invisible disability, and she is the co-lead of the UK Disability Confidence Network at GSK, and I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about herself. Great. Thank you, Dana. Thank you for letting me be part of your session and um, for everybody attending to let me share my story with them. Um, I just want to echo Gareth and Dana's point that what I'm going to share is my own personal experience story. And it's rather than, even though it has been negative, I've used it in a positive way to really fuel my passion and purpose in life as well. Um, so Dana mentioned about, um, I have an invisible disability called shock and every tooth disease. So, this is a complex disability. Um, it's degenerative, so I've had it since birth. So it's a motor and sensory 
peripheral neuropathy. So what that means, it affects the physical aspects of my life. It's an umbrella of many different conditions, such as muscle dystrophy, cerebral palsy, dystonia. So my hands, jaws, feet lock up. Dysrhythmia affected my speech and my throat area. Uh, sclerosis, disbulge. Um, only two more. I've got poor balance coordination as well. And um, I can't walk without my footwear or special insoles and um, ankle supports. But regardless of having all of that to, to live on a daily basis, um, it affects me in different ways. Certain days I'm not able to even get out of bed or even speak. Um, I don't know how my day will be day to day because it's all dependent on how my body is reacting and coping but I never let anything affect me in my life or live the quality of life I want as well so that's good thank you and so much top, Leah, for being so open yeah so can you tell me about a time where you felt that you didn't belong yeah so uh, this was in my previous company and um so as Dana mentioned, I'm the lead at my current company for the Disability Network. At my previous company, I was also the lead of the Disability Network there. Um, I This is one story. So we were looking for a sponsor for that particular network and we approached the managing director at that time of the company. And um, we went, I went up to him, I shared the story in terms of our purpose, what we want. I also gave a bit of insight, just like I did to you all now, what my condition was. However, by me just saying he, that person didn't believe me. So what I had to do is take off my shoes, take off my socks, take out my insoles, take off my ankle support and stand and if you see me stand I can't stand I need help and support uh, but I had to go to that extreme to just prove that I had a disability just because I don't look like I have one um, there's been other examples so I mentioned that I can only wear if I can only wear trainers as they're the most comfiest with my ankle supports and everything uh, so I used to get comments and even now I'm not gonna lie in my current company I do still get these comments made that oh um, why do you get to wear trainers for how come you got trainers in my previous company I used to have a sit-stand desk and people used to come up to me and say oh my gosh you're so special I really want one of those and I was just thinking if you imagine the amount of pain I'm going through right now and I can't even stand properly so I'm having problem standing and back problem however because I'm quite confident and articulate I used to joke it off but it kind of made me reflect and think that people are either damn right arrogant or people have never been exposed to different people and the way they are and the different layers to them as well so I just stepped back and really thought to myself how can I help to educate and um, support them so that's when I got involved in setting up the networks within the workplaces and not just in workplace within society so outside work as well so those are a few examples, uh, Dana, and there are more, but <laughs> list goes on. But this is why I'm here trying to help share, educate people as well. But yeah. So Priya, can you now tell us about a time when you felt like you did belong? Yes, of course. And um, I love that picture, especially your trainers. So if anybody ever sees me in person, you'll always see me with the brightest trainers. And, and she is not exaggerating. Time. She has the yeah. brightest trainers there's, that have ever been made in the history of the world. There's <laughs> no why if I should get trainers. They're just like, oh, what do you get it? <laughs> but um, so there's times, especially where I'm working at the moment, I feel I, I belong and I'm accepted for who I am. So as I mentioned, in a corporate company, where I was working before, it was investment banking. So it was that stigma, that persona, suited, booted, you cannot wear any of it, Stevia. But in this company, I can wear 
my trainers I want and it's all been and I'm going to refer to this as my team and the individual that I'm around who really helped me to feel comfortable so before when I used to get asked like oh how come you're wearing trainers right now I'll get oh I love your trainers and it's that psychological thing uh, rather than someone handing me for wearing a different colour trainers they they really they really make me feel comfortable and bring my whole self to work as well. And another thing, as I mentioned, my voice. So I've had to, for about two years now, I've struggled with voice fatigue. So I've had to go to speech and language to help maintain it. Um, and I, in my former role, I work as an agile coach. So I'm constantly talking. So it's really important for me to maintain this. But what I've learned is to communicate with my team and communicate with people to really help me because my disability is invisible. I've had to bring a lot of it visible. So psychologically, this affects me a lot when training, I don't want to be all about my condition or me. I want to be able to give the best to who I'm teaching to as well. So uh, those are a few examples where I feel really be myself and it's been the environment the individuals and i'd like to just put another thing there there's some sort of any any inclusion diversity society makes us feel disabled i personally don't feel disabled at all like i do literally everything i want enjoy life but because of stigmas because of criteria people box you into these things and you're actually not that you are who you are um but yeah that's Thank you so much for sharing, Priya. I think it is wonderful that now you get to be seen for your abilities and not for your disability and yeah. that you are standing out in, in a more positive way and you feel like you belong. Because the truth is, if we really think about it, we all, all have occasions where we would have felt like we didn't belong right? We would have felt excluded. If it's a sport thing where you got picked last and you were the last person standing there, or I don't know what, we have all though felt the feeling of being excluded. And once you have felt it, why would you ever want someone else to feel that way? It is in our direct power to affect the way that people feel at work. There are small things that we can all do that can make a change. And so I just want to end the session by telling you about something that's called the belonging basket. Why is it called the belonging basket? It's called that because when I run it, I literally take a wicker basket with me and that's where people put their entries in. And so I'm going to explain. I briefly introduce what belonging is and what belonging should feel like to an organization. And then I ask them to th think about whether or not they feel that they belong. And if they feel that they don't belong, they have unlimited little pieces of paper, card and markers that they get when they walk in and they can write one point per piece of paper describing to the organization what could be done to make them feel that sense of belonging. Now, the first time I ran this, there were 371 pieces of paper in the belonging basket, which were ideas of what could be done by individuals, by the firm, to help improve that sense of belonging. And I took those and I grouped them into various themes so that together with the organization, we had a way forward, some areas to work on, some things highlighted where we needed action. We had those key themes. The organization who I ran it with for the very first time has given their consent today for me to share some of the entries from that very first belonging basket. And I've picked the ones that I felt were most powerful in the moment. And I would like to share some of those with you. The first is, don't treat me like an oddity. Stop asking to touch my hair. And I really felt this because this is one that happens to me all the time. Sometimes I'm on public transport and someone just touches it and doesn't even ask. And it's very awkward. So it resonated with me. Don't. No one wants to be treated like an oddity. And it definitely doesn't make people feel that they belong. 
Next was stop calling me by the names of the other black people who work here. We are not all the same. And this one made me smile as well because there was a place where my husband worked and there were two black guys who worked there and they were constantly, constantly getting mistaken from each other, even though they look completely and totally different. Stop asking me where I'm from. I was born here and so were my parents and grandparents. So just because somebody looks like they're from a different ethnicity doesn't make them any less British, right? So that where are you from question can really make you feel separate and apart. More vegan and vegetarian options in the cafe and at socials and meetings. This one seems really tiny, but if you live your life as a vegan and vegetarian and there are no options for you, you cannot eat. How can you possibly feel like you belong? So that's something to look out for. Staff unisex toilets was another one. So this company had unisex toilets for the clients only, but not for the staff. So that's why that one was raised. A designated prayer room. You'll be pleased to know that they now have a designated prayer and meditation room. They used a meeting room, which they had several of available to do it. Hire more people like me, especially in senior leadership. Everyone wants to be able to see themselves within the organization. That's very important. Have socials in places other than the pub. You all must know why I feel this one so strongly because of my pub aversion from my previous years. Drinks should not always be on a Friday. Now, what was interesting about this company is that there were several Jewish people who worked there. Friday is the Sabbath. So the team goes out for drinks on the Friday. They can never attend. They are literally always excluded. That's not cool. Don't make fun of my accent. That goes without saying, and I'm sorry, this is not banter. It could never be banter. Stop expecting me to be the voice of all gay people. And this is not just for gay people. Sometimes when you are a minority, everyone is looking to you for the black perspective or the female perspective or whatever it is. And you cannot answer for an entire population of people. And it isn't fair to put that burden on any one individual. Some social should be a part of the workday. I have children, I can't stay late. So people who have to relieve their carers or pick their kids up from school, maybe finishing an hour early for that day so they can socialize for an hour before they have to go home is a good idea instead of shutting them out completely. Respect my religion. Just gonna pause there. No more silence, speak up. Stop excusing racism and sexism as banter. So this company had a very strong bants culture. And so lots of things were excused as being banter, as being jokes, even in the higher levels of the organization. So something needed to be done about that. But mind you, the onus isn't just on people who are in senior leadership to speak up. You can also speak up, use your voice. And finally, let me speak. So there was a point in time where people kept speaking over me in my career. It was almost like I wasn't there because I guess I was saying islandy things. And there was this one director who I worked with very closely and he was excessively good at saying, Dana's trying to say something. Can we amplify that, etc., to make space for me to talk? So that's something that we should be looking out to do for anyone who feels like they don't belong. So many options, so many small things in here that we can think about and that we can start doing right away. But this is one organization's belonging basket. The question is, if you ran this exercise for your organization, what would your belonging basket say? I just want to end with a few little tips about getting started as you move on your belonging journey as an organization. And the first thing is try and remember what it feels when you don't belong. Because I think if everyone starts from that position of remembering what exclusion feels like, 
we will work so much harder as a group to make sure that people belong. The second thing is start small. It may feel daunting to try and change an entire organization overnight. So why not just start with your team, your small team? Stay alert and no, this is not the government's COVID slogan. What I mean is be vigilant and look around you. So look to see if people are being excluded. Check to see if there are vegan options. Look out for which co-workers haven't been attending socials, etc., and try and see why. Look out for the small things. Be alert. And then think of things you can do as an individual, personally, to boost belonging. So if you're organizing a social, think about the planning of that social. If you're doing an activity, think about getting more voices to be heard. That's what I mean. Start with you. It does start with you. The final thing is, please consider running a belonging basket exercise of your own. Or if you don't want to, ask the question, who feels like they belong? And it should be anonymous the first time so that people really feel that they can be honest about where they are in terms of belonging and you know where you have to go from that point going forward. Thank you for staying to the end of Belonging at Work. I hope you enjoyed it. This is to say thank you for everyone who attended in person, to you for watching the recording, but especially to both Gareth and Priya, who were so selfless in the sharing of their stories. The session would not have been the same without them, so I give my deepest thanks.